Well, uh, I hope you are looking at the slide now is with the titles, the danger of underdamped filters. This is a, this is a topic I was considering to present in this uh, symposium because I have found this problem in, in some uh, different products in the last two years. Uh, products from the automotive uh, business, from uh, uh, motor controls or uh, uh, medical devices, for example. Let me go to the next slide and then we will have some demos. Uh, this is my laboratory, the High Frequency Magic Lab. So I will be happy to receive you in Spain if you came to Zaragoza. It's a city between Madrid and Barcelona. Uh, let me start with the problem. Remember, we are interested in EMI. In EMI, we have two different problems. The first problem is uh, considering that the coupling of energy from the carpet to the victim is through the air. This is what we call radiated emissions. The second problem, sometimes the radiated emissions are coming from unintended uh, antennas, like for example, a coffee machine or a computer or something like that. Sometimes the noise is coming from a device with antennas. It's a wireless device with a walkie-talkie, a telephone or something like that. The other possibility to have EMI problems is to have the noise going from the carpet to the victim through the power supply system, DC or AC, depending on the application. This is what we call conducted emissions. And if you remember from any uh, basic book about EMC, these kind of problems can be represented with three different elements. One is the source of the problem. The second is the victim or the system that is being affected by the electromagnetic energy. And finally, we have a coupling mechanism a way to go from the carpet to the victim. Usually people is able to identify, not always, but easily uh, the culprit and the victim. And the most difficult part is to identify how is the coupling mechanism. Remember the solutions. The solution that for many people is going to the coupling mechanism. So when they have a, some kind of non-conducted emission problem, for example, a radiated emission problem, the solution usually is to apply some kind of shield. If the problem is conducted through, for example, uh, power supply cables, the solution usually is filtering. Remember that this is not the best solution for EMI. The best solution for EMI, the, best, the first solution you need to try is to kill the culprit. If you kill the culprit, you will have a lot of possibilities to solve the problem in conducted and radiated emissions at low cost and very efficiently. Sometimes this is not possible and we need to apply some kind of filter or some kind of shielding or both of them. Okay, so how is the problem I will try to explain today? The problem is consider you have a product. This product is an electronic converter. It's a product with a transistor, IGBTs or something like that. And it's working with a EMC filter in front of the uh, power supply system. The system is uh, including this uh, filter, it's a pi filter, for example, or LC filter, something like that, with big inductors, big capacitors, and the idea is how this filter was designed. This is what I have found in my experience. The first possibility is that many people is using the same filter that was working in a previous model of the product. So if the previous model of the product was uh, complying with conducted emissions, they take the same filter, they introduce in the new model, and they try to uh, pass the test. If they don't pass the test, they start to tune the components. They add a capacitor or increase the value of a capacitor or increase or decrease the value of some inductor, something like that. How is the second possibility? The second possibility is to apply some kind of trial and error process. We start to introduce capacitors, inductors, as we can until we try to go below the limits. This is dangerous because sometimes you will not obtain a good result or sometimes your filter will be bigger or more expensive than needed. We have an additional possibility is we try to replicate the filter that was working with a competitor. I don't like that solution, but perhaps you are trying this. This is not a good or elegant way to solve the problem. The, sec the next solution could be to use a commercial filter. Many people think that using a commercial filter is expensive. This is not always in this way. Remember that it's not the same to be working uh, manufacturing, I don't know, one million, two million of units every year 
or you are manufacturing a small uh, number of units every year with a high cost. So sometimes it, it, it using a commercial filter is a, um, a good solution because you will go to the market faster. And finally, the option number five is to design the filter from the scratch. I mean, you are measuring how is the injected uh, a noise to the power supply system, and you identify how is the attenuation you need, how is the cutoff frequency, you select the inductors, the capacitors, using some kind of software or things like that. You need for this process uh, some expertise, and of course you need time. But in the same way, you will be learning how to design filters. So my recommendation is to try always option five, but if you are not uh, on time, perhaps you need to go to some of the previous solutions. Three important things about filters I have found in my experience. The first one, people design this kind of filters only for emissions. They are worried about uh, passing conducted emissions test. Remember, filters are good for immunity. If you design the filter considering both emissions and immunity, probably you will need to apply less uh, components for protecting uh, with uh, high voltages or transients. Second idea, they are not usually considered for radiated emissions. These kind of filters are designed for the typical frequency range from 9 kilohertz to 30 megahertz. Remember this frequency range is for conducted emissions. From 30 megahertz to 1 gigahertz or higher frequencies, these, these uh, problems are usually radiated. And the design of these filters could be done for the frequency range from 9 kilohertz up to, I don't know, uh, perhaps 100 megahertz. So in this way, you will be able to control or to limit how much is the frequencies that from 30 megahertz to 100, 200 megahertz are going to introduce it to the mains cable. The mains cable is a very important antenna in your pro in your products. So many of your radiated emissions problems, especially with power electronic converters, will be in the frequency range from 30 megahertz to uh, 60 or 100 megahertz. And finally, be careful about using low cost components. I have found many times that we try a solution with a good component where you have a good model, a good behavior, I don't know, in parasitics, in saturation, or things like that, and many people try to go to a low-cost equivalent. Be careful about finding equivalents that are low-cost. Not always they will work in the same way. So the, the idea is I have this situation. This is my product, and in front of the product, I have a filter that was designed in some of these ways. Let's go to the uh, EMC laboratory, and we try to pass immunity. What happened in immunity? The, in the laboratory, we are applying a high voltage peak at the input of the system, and something in your product is destroyed, usually semiconductors, your transistors, your diodes, IGBTs, things like that. No? Remember that in the protection for transients, we have three different solutions. The first solution is to introduce some kind of clamping device. Clamping device usually are varistors or TVS di diodes. The second solution is to introduce some kind of crowbar device, something like gas discharge tubes or SCRs or something like that. And finally, the next solution or a combination with the previous is to introduce the filter. So in some way, the transient has high frequency content. So with the low pass filter, we can limit how much is the uh, energy that is going to the device. But in this case, it's not possible. We apply a transient and the device is destroyed. Remember, this filter was designed for EMC conducted emissions, not for immunity. So let's go to your solution. You consider, oh, let's introduce in front of the EMC filter a varistor. With a varistor, I will be clamping the maximum voltage to some kind of value that is safe for my semiconductors. For example, if your semiconductors don't work with voltages over 900 volts, you need to limit the, volt to the voltage to 900 volts. You can introduce here a 600 volts varistor to protect the, your devices. And then you go to the laboratory. And in the laboratory, 
you with the barista in place, you fail again. You look at this position, this voltage, and you find that the barista is working as expected. So we are clamping in 600 volts, but the devices are being broken. This is what we will try to explain today because many people don't understand how it's possible that with a 600 voltage maximum input, you are destroying the baristors, or sorry, the, the uh, semiconductors in your electronic device. And I will try to explain this with two demos. Eh? I hope we will have time for the two demos. One is with simulation. I'm going to use LTS spice. And in the LTS spice model, I will be trying to apply a high voltage transient and my uh, electronic circuit will be very, very simple. You can see here the basic model before opening LT LTS spice. The first things to consider is the input voltage. The input voltage is a 230 volts, 50 hertz uh, power supply from line and neutral. Okay, I, this is, I am not working the three-phase option of my model. This is a coupling, the coupling network. It's used to avoid the transients I am going to generate to go to the main network. And with this box here, I will be creating a transient like in the laboratory. Eh? Really, I am considering to use something like 61,045 uh, uh, limits. The, my device is something like this. It's a very simple circuit. It's a, a diode bridge with a small capacitor and a resistor. Obviously, this is a linear circuit, and this circuit will not be creating noise so we perhaps we don't need the EMC filter in this application, but I am not interested in creating a, um, a complex circuit switching so my simulations are uh, longer. I am trying to demonstrate how I can affect these diodes. So my victims basically will be the diodes in the uh, diode bridge. You can see here the EMC filter. My EMC filter, you will see the uh, details later, is something like this. It's a common mode choke that is trying to filter common mode noise and a couple of X capacitors, okay? So I'm going to apply a transient between line and neutral. And this transient in theory will be affecting to my diodes in the, sec in the output of the filter. Let's try to go to the simulation. Let me open the LTS spice option. Okay, here. Step one, let me show you the transient here. Okay, this is my basic circuit. Remember, power supply, CDN, the coupling, the coupling network, the transient generator, and the output of the transient generator. We run the test, and then we see how is the voltage here. Okay, let's go to this window. And you can see, I have a 300 volts in peak sinusoidal 50 hertz signal. And at some point, I have the transient. It's a two kilovolts transient, okay? We can see the detail of the transient where we have some kind of ringing. This is typical related with inductances and capacitances in the circuit. Let me close the transient generator. And let me open the second step. In the second step, let me go here, uh, here. In the second step, whoop, there is, okay, let me close here. I don't know why it's not here, here. Okay, in the second step, what I am doing is to up, uh, connect at the output of the transient generator and the power supply input, my circuit. Remember, my circuit is, used, is with four diodes. It's a, a, a bridge rectifier with a capacitor and a 50 ohms a resistor. So I have some kind of uh, bats here. Let me run the test. And then we can see how is the result. Let's go here. Let me go to this part of the system. And obviously, uh, we, we run the test till 40 milliseconds like previously let me return to another simulation 
I'm going to uh, simulate more time. You can see that the signal is sinusoidal again at the input of the system, but voltage is close to 1,200 volts, not 2.4 volt, kilovolts. Okay, so the voltage has been limited. Remember, we are trying to analyze this picture here. Okay, so if you go here, you will see that the voltage around 1,200 volts is limited. Why is this? This is because in Maya diodes, we are going to break over situation. So now the diode will be destroyed. This is the voltage, the blue color is the voltage in the diode in reverse. So you can see how much is the current in the diode. The current in diode is going to more than 140 amps and the diode will be destroyed. So this is the typical situation. If you put these diodes in front of this test, the diodes will uh, be destroyed. Look at this. If you see here in the model of the diode, the break down voltage is 1,200 volts. This is the maximum voltage before going into breakdown zone. That is because the uh, voltage is limited to this value. <clears throat> but in the real application, the diode will be destroyed. Okay, so let's put in front of the bridge, let's put a um, EMC filter. Let me go here. T spice. Why? Okay, let's go here. The, let me add a filter. It's the same simulation. Now here is the transient generation and the input power supply. This is my circuit and this is the EMC filter. Let's go to run the test. And now you can see here. Okay, it's running. Wait a moment, 60, 80%, 90%. Okay, and we can see how is the voltage at the input. The voltage at the input is now close to two kilovolts. So in the input, there is no limit in the transient. But what happened in the output? In the output, the voltage is clamped to 1,200 volts. So again, the diodes, the SCRs or the IGBTs or the transistors you are using will be destroyed. This is the original situation. You go to the laboratory with your product, with your EMC filter, you apply the transient and the device is destroyed. So the first solution you think about is to introduce some kind of transient limiter. So let's go to the next step. It's something like this. It's a step four, is to introduce a baristor. So now in front of the filter, we introduce a baristor. What we are trying to do is to protect the diodes. Obviously, with the baristor in front of the EMC filter, we are protecting additionally the components of the filter. So let's run the test and let's go to the window for the filter. This is my filter. Okay. This is the slides you are uh, you will be able to uh, see in the to obtain in from Omicron. Okay, this is my filter. My filter is using two capacitors, these two capacitors of 150 nanofarads and a common mode choke that is 10 millihenries in a common mode value. If you test or you go to the data sheet of the component, you will see that the leakage inductance for this common mode choke is around 58 microhenries. That means for conducted emissions in differential mode, this is my filter. It's a filter with 58 microhenries and two capacitors, 150 nanofarads yeah, per two. So this is a three components. Every component is introducing something like 20 dBs per decade. So we have a response that will be around minus 60 dBs, 60 dBs per decade. This is what I was expecting. Obviously, the cutoff frequency will be related with the L and the C values, okay? We will see this later. So this is the filter I am trying to use in my application. Let's go to the simulation again, okay, here. And let's see how is the result. Oh, you see 40% late. Okay, let's go to the 
previous screen, okay? And let's show you how is the capacitor. The capacitor I am using with 150 nanofarads is, has a resonant frequency of around one, two, three, four, uh, around four megahertz resonant frequency for this capacitor. It's a capacitor with a very low ESR. It's a high Q component. And this is the impedance of the inductor. The impedance in black color is the impedance in common mode. It's something like if you represent the choke in this way, with these terminals short circuited, and this is the impedance we are offering for the common mode signals where this is heard, okay? And the uh, red color is the leakage inductance. In a theoretically perfect inductor, common mode choke, this, in, this leakage inductor is zero. This is not really good because if you don't, uh, if you have a very, very uh, good coupling between the two inductive elements, uh, there is no leakage inductance. And the leakage inductance is very useful for uh, filtering differential mode. At the same time, be careful about this leakage inductance because you can saturate the core. No? So you go to any point in this graph, you take this frequency and you consider that this omega leakage inductance you will be able to extract how much is the leakage inductance for this inductor, okay? Another possibility, you have uh, uh, the both 100, you can take the inductor, something like this, and you can source circuit in this way to see how is the input impedance of this component to extract the leakage inductance. So let's go to the simulation, in case he's finished it. It's 80, 90%, 91. It's going slower because I have a lot of cameras and I have a lot of uh, things connected to my computer today. One oscilloscope. Okay, so let's go to see how is the signal at the input. And you see this. Look at this. The varistor is clamping the voltage. It's no more than 800 volts, more or less 800 volts. The 800 volts for my 1,200 volts diodes is a safe value. So why is possible that the diodes are being broken? Look at this. If I see how is the voltage in the diode, you can see that the voltage is 100, 1,200 volts. So really, in front of my system, I have the protection, but the diode is being destroyed. Many people don't understand this because they measure with the oscilloscope how is the voltage at the input but they don't measure how is the voltage at the uh, output of the filter. Remember that the voltage at the output of the filter is not the same like the voltage at the input. You can see that it's a replica in the area where we have the transient. That is because the diodes are broken. So to understand this, we need to check how is the filter. So let me open the filter. This is my filter, okay? And I am going to test the filter in time domain and in frequency domain. If you are interested in understanding what is inside of the filter, we can open the schematic and you can see that I have the capacitors of 150 nanofarads. I am using the model from Booth Electronics. This, you can find this uh, model in Red Expert, uh, the website of uh, Booth Electronics. So this component really is the component including the parasitic inductance and the parasitic uh, resistance, the ESR. And this is the model, the full model of the inductor. Remember that what we have inside of this box is this response. If we go to the previous slide, is the response we have seen in this picture, okay? So let's close the schematic of the filter. Let's run the test, okay? And now let me close these circuits here. Uh, let me put both windows vertically and we can see, oh, sorry, this is not the output of the filter. The output of the filter is this one. Okay, this one. Okay, this, this, ah, uh, let me remove this one. Okay, and then is the voltage between the input terminal, the output terminal. And let me remove the, uh, face. Let me remove the, this is, 
Let me remove the phrase. Okay. So you can see here, how is the response of the filter? The response of the filter is zero dBs in the low frequency range. That means these frequencies are passing without being affected. And we have the slope in attenuation until we arrive to the resonant effects created by the parasitics in the components in both the capacitors and the inductors. But look at this. At this position, the voltage in the output related with the voltage in the input is over zero dBs. Here, really, we have uh, from the cursor 6.4 dBs. That means that in this frequency range, we have gain. That is because we have the transient in the output of the filter. So let's compare what happened in the time domain. Okay, if we go here, okay, let me go here. We select the AC analysis like a comment and we open the transient analysis to create a, a view of the a response of the filter when we apply a step response at the input. We can run the test and you can see that if this is the input, this is what we are applying at the, oops, sorry. If this is the voltage we are applying at the input, it's a step response. I am introducing one volt. Eh? This is the output of the filter. Okay. You can see that because the system is under damped, we have this value in the output. So when we have a volt, a, a transient at the input of my power supply, and this transient has a high DIDT, the response of the system, because the filter is under damped, is in the output bigger than the input. This is what is happening. In our application, we have 800 volts limited by the clamping action of the varistor. But in the output, the voltage is going over 1,200 volts. Really, the diodes clamp the system, but they are broken. So how is the solution for this problem? This problem is very related with the problem you can read if you are interested in DC-DC converters, no? Like when you are designing a back converter and you want to apply the stability criteria from Middlebrook, no? You know that the input filter must be damped. So one of the solutions for this problem, that is not the same problem of instability of the DC-DC converter, the idea is to introduce some kind of additional uh, losses. Typically, you can introduce losses in the inductor, you can introduce losses in series with the inductor, or you can introduce losses in the output. Eh? A typical solution is introducing a capacitor in, at the input that is in a value that is uh, perhaps five to 10 times the capacitor inside of the filter. So if the capacitor in the filter is 150 nanofarads, I am using a 560 nanofarad capacitor. And with a resistor that is related with the characteristic impedance of the filter. Really the value of this resistor is the square root of L over C, where L is the value of the inductor, the leakage inductance, and the C is the value of the capacitor. So if we run the test, what we will get is something like this. If this was the previous result, remember the input is something like this, remember that now we will have this. So we have this under damped, pardon, sorry, damped uh, ringing, but we are not losing the uh, attenuation in this area. Remember that if you try to do this solution, something like this, if you try to do this, if this is your filter, and you try to introduce the losses in the output capacitor, the advantage is that you are saving one component. But remember, in high frequencies, the response of the filter goes from a third order filter to a second order filter. So you will lose 20 dBs per decade. So it's better to introduce a new capacitor here with a resistor in place. This is the damping network. This is the value of the capacitor. This is something like ten, five times this capacitor. You can try by simulation. Obviously, you can uh, do this mathematically with equations, but sometimes because you have resistance in the inductor, ESR in the capacitors, it's not very easy to uh, apply mathematics, and simulation is very useful here. And this is the damping resistance that is more or less this value. 
So you obtain a Q equal to one. That means there is a dumped situation for the resonance circuit. And this is what we will try. We will try here is to open this system. Uh, let me see, applying the system, and we will try to run the test, okay? Okay, because it's something slow. Remember, I, am, I have the oscilloscope, the cameras connected to my computer. Let's uh, run the test, and let's go to the laboratory to show you something similar in real time, okay? So this is what I am going to show you. This is a filter with a capacitor and one inductor. My capacitor here is around 150 nanofarads. My inductor is around one uh, millihenry, really 90, 965 microhenries in a small PC board, nothing more. So I can connect and disconnect easily. What I'm going to use is both 100, so you can see how is the response of the filter. Right? Because the uh, load for this application will be one megohm, because I will be connecting to the oscilloscope. Let me put here a one megohm resistor that is the load impedance for my circuit here. Okay, this one megohm resistor. And then the output of the bolt 100 is connected to the input of the circuit. The channel number one of the bolt 100 is connected to the input of the circuit. So we are able to see how is the voltage at the input. And the channel number two of the bolt 100 is connected to the output of the filter. Okay, something like this. So you, you see here the connection. And now let me open bolt 100. Bolt 100 is here. Okay, this is the software. Okay, and let me open here. This is the, let me open the file for the gain, the filter response. I have pre-calibrated the response of the cables. It's not perfect now, but I hope you will be able to see the response, okay? So let's go to uh, from uh, one kilohertz, something like one kilohertz, for example. Okay, okay, okay. You can see here the response of the filter with a strong uh, peak under dump it. Let me save this in memory. And what I am going to do now is to put in parallel with the output capacitor, we are going to connect a capacitor that is bigger inside. I'm going to use, oh, sorry, this is the LTS voice. This is the electrolytic capacitor with uh, some ESR. Sometimes the ESR of the electrolytic capacitor is good for this purpose, not in this case. So I need to additionally introduce this resistor. This is a resistor of around 80 ohms. That is the value of resistance we need for damping this response. And then we can run the test again. Okay. Oh, yeah, I know. Let me let me remove. I forgot. I This is a mistake. I switched input and output of the filter. Okay, so let me connect again. Let me put this camera so you can see here additionally. Okay, let me connect the input. The input of the filter is this one. I switch it input and output. This is channel number one of the bolt 100. This one. And this is channel two of the bolt 100 in the output in the load resistor. Okay, this way. Okay, and then let me run again the test. Oops. Where is this? What happened? Let me see. This is the input. Mm -mm. And this is the output. Is correct? What is wrong here? Yep. What is this? Let's Ah, now. Let me. It was a problem with uh, out optimized. Now, okay, perfect. Sorry. Let me update the memory. So this is the response of the filter, and we have in memory now. And let me introduce the 
electrolytic capacitor in parallel with the capacitor in the output and the resistor. That is, remember, 80 ohms in value. It's the same circuit I have explained before. So this is the response. Okay, you can see how it's dumped this way. Let me go to the simulation here again, and you can see that in this window, we see how is the voltage at the input. Okay, it's 800 volts, and look at this. This is the damping network in the output of the filter. So now the output voltage is something like this. You can see that is lower from uh, less than 1.2 kilovolts. So the diodes are not working now, but we are close to the system. Why is it possible that the input and the output are not limited? This is because if, you, if we go to the response of the filter, our previous simulation, this one, testing filters, no, sorry. If I open the damping filter, you can see that the response of my damped circuit was not perfect. Okay, if we go here, in theory, this response is damped, but if you make a zoom, you will see that there is no perfect zero dBs here. So we have some kind of ringing. Eh? We need to uh, try a better damping network, but at least in this situation, the circuit, the diodes will not be broken, okay? Finally, something that I have found that is useful, perhaps is not um, interesting if you are very limited in cost, is to introduce the two baristas. This is a typical solution. If you have no time to optimize the filter or to optimize the damping network to make a different uh, um, test, no? So if we run the test here, Let's uh, uh, go with the simulation in time. We go again to the window, to the cameras. And now let me show you what happened if I use my filter with the oscilloscope, okay? What I'm going to do is to disconnect the boat 100. We are going to connect the filter to the oscilloscope. So I remove the one megohm resistor let me use this accessory. So I connect the filter here. Okay. And now let me introduce a transient at the output. Really, it's not a transient. What I am doing here is to introduce a voltage. The yellow color is the voltage that is going in the output of the filter. And the green color is the input to the filter. Let me connect it this way in this way, okay? You can see that I am trying to uh, create a transient, <clears throat> considering that the signal that is going to the filter is a DC level. You can see the DC level here. The DC level is the same in the input and in the output of the filter. It's an LC filter, like the previous one. This is the filter I have uh, measured it here, okay? And then you can see how is the response in the output. You can see that I have a peak that is bigger. Let me make a zoom here so you can see what happened, no? So now I am going to um, apply a, a clamping device at the input. Remember, the input is the green color. Consider that the input must be below 5.6 volts. So let me introduce a transient protector, okay? You can see that with the transient protector in front of the filter, the maximum voltage is clamped. But in the output of the filter, we have a very big peak. This is the peak that can destroy the systems inside. If we introduce a damping network, the previous damping network with the electrolytic capacitor and the 80 ohms, we get something like this, no? So the, we are damping in some way, not perfectly, because you have seen here that the damping is not perfect. Eh? We have a small quantity over zero dBs, but at least the electronics is safe. If we go to the simulation now with the two, uh, with the two uh, varistors, uh, we will be able to see 
how is the response, but it's not finished it, and we are on time. So it's, it's a, we are in a 37% of um, simulation. So I think it's time to finish 